So I want to, first of all, you know, welcome back our online audience virtually, who hopefully you enjoyed the video selection that we provided you. And I hope our in-person attendees here enjoyed both the uh, dinner and dessert served at, at tonight's event. So it's annual tradition here in which our past St. Georgie Prize winner chairs the selection committee the following year. So like we said, because this year is a combined 2020 and 21 awards program, I want to welcome back to the stage uh, Dr. Susan Horowitz, who's going to be presenting our 2021 St. Georgie Prize for Progress Cancer Research winners. Thank you very much. So it's my. It's not on. It's on? OK, great. So good evening again. And it's wearing different shoes now. And um, it's really my honor and pleasure on behalf of the selection committee, which I chaired, to present the 2021 San Giorgi Prize to two truly remarkable scientists. Dr. Tack Mack, a senior scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and university professor at the University of Toronto, and Dr. Mark Davis, professor of microbiology and immunology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. This award recognizes their complementary breakthrough discoveries of the structure of the T cell receptor. The search for the T cell receptor was like searching for the holy grail of immunology. So these discoveries were truly groundbreaking. In 1984, Dr. Mack used an innovative molecular strategy to clone the gene encoding the beta chain of the human T cell receptor, while Dr. Davis used a different but equally novel strategy to do the same for the mouse T cell receptor. Dr. Mack's group was among the first to generate genetically modified mouse strains to study molecules involved in the development and control of the immune system and the process of tumorigenesis. At the same time, Dr. Davis's group had been successfully exploiting the biochemistry and structural biology of the T cell receptor to understand its function. Their combined discoveries were not only a critical breakthrough in our understanding of adaptive immunity, but also launched a new era of cell-based immune therapy for cancer. From their combined research, an effective new form of cancer treatment has been developed for blood cancers with the expectation that the results will benefit patients with a variety of malignancies. These are two outstanding scientists with many, many different awards, the Royal Society, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Science, just to name a few. The National Foundation for Cancer Research has always stressed the importance of supporting basic research, even though its impact on clinical medicine may not always be obvious at the outset. In the work of Drs. Mack and Davis, we can clearly see how their discoveries became a critical part of T cell therapies for the treatment of lymphomas and leukemia, plus other hematopoietic malignancies. I know that for a scientist, there is no greater a reward than realizing that your research in the laboratory is helping patients that are suffering from cancer. I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm sweet and short.
All right. Does this does this control the slides? It does. Good. Fantastic. The first slide, or uh... oh, there it is. Oh, good. Great. Uh, oh, it's. Oh yeah, there it is. So the message here is think outside the cage. All right. That means something. Um, which means that uh, we've really been uh, interested in human immunology generally and human cancer and, and the mysteries of the immune system uh, that are in every cancer patient and in many other uh, patients with other immunological diseases. And uh, But what I've... Um, I can't possibly uh, top uh, Susan's origin story. There are no trees in this, in this <laughs> thing. That was, that was brilliant. Uh, but, but there are some intriguing things about cancer that, that have bothered me. And one of them is uh, I had a very talented uh, fellow, Arnold Hahn, who's now at Columbia, who came up with a, a really nice uh, way of uh, getting single cell information from T cells in terms of their T cell receptors. And because T cell receptors are like a barcode, then the more cells that have the same barcode means they came from the same lineage. They came from the same original cell and they proliferated. And if you look at a cancer like colon cancer in, in these experiments that uh, Arnold did, uh, you can see that in the, oh, sorry, in the tumor, Maybe we can do that. Uh, sorry, wrong, wrong thing. Yeah, in the tumor, there's a where you see a, a broader pod. That means there are many T cells that have identical T cell receptors. That means that there was proliferation. That that those T cells reacted to something in the tumor and made many other T cells just like them with exactly the same T cell receptor. Um, so, and, and it turned out that uh, most of the CD4 T cells in this case were the products of clonal proliferation. Whereas if you look at adjacent uh, colon tissue, there was almost no uh, clonal expansion. Uh, so that says that there were T cells in this tumor and in other tumors like this that, that had seen something and then reacted to it and made other cells just like them, identically, uh, uh, with respect to the T cell receptor. So why is that? And then they didn't do anything. Then they stopped. So there was a response that started, and then it stopped. Why did it stop? That became a central question. And we didn't really know what to do with this until a few years later. We uh, were, were, were looking at uh, self and non-self specific T cells in healthy human beings. And the dogma at that time for 25 years was that self-specific T cells are eliminated in the thymus very, very efficiently. And there were brilliant mouse experiments uh, showing this. But it turned out those were artifacts. Um, and that if you look at normal, healthy people, you see lots of self-specific T cells. There's some depression, there's some elimination of some of them, but, but really there's still a lot left. And uh, this was pretty amazing, and, and we knew it was amazing because it took four years to publish this paper. It was so against the, <laughs> so against, so against the dogma of the time. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, this says that, that you have lots of self-specific cells, but, but what happens to them? What, how is it that most of us don't get on immunity? And it turns out that these, there were these cells, but they were repressed from being activated. And this was this experiment where uh, in the top, you see the self-specific T cells we isolated from healthy human being, and we stimulated them with their antigen, and nothing happened. They just sat around, died in culture. Whereas the foreign-specific T cells we isolated from the same people proliferate just fine. They were they were very happy to proliferate with response to their uh, particular antigen. So there was clearly a, a a control. What was that control? It turned out that control was innate immunity that if we put in um, 
agonists for particular innate immune cells, T cells, a TLR2 agonist, and a, a NOD2, which affects dendritic cells, now they were behaved exactly the same. The, the self and non-self T cells from healthy people both proliferated, were happy, did, did what they're supposed to do. So then we did the Hale Miller experiment, which, which is to say, well, maybe the reason that there are these T cells in tumors that are not doing anything, but they did do something earlier, but now they're not doing anything, maybe it's because of tolerance. Maybe it's because they're being treated as if they were self-specific, which indeed they are. That's what cancer is yourself. So, um, so this is where having a, a really a brilliant postdoctoral fellow, um, Chen Yin, came into the lab, who's an expert polymer chemist. And she took on this project to say, well, what if we made nanoparticles on the top here and loaded them with these agonists that stimulate the innate immune system and basically stimulate as if it was an infection uh, and then put those into mouse tumors, would anything happen? Uh, and things did happen. That is, in this particular tumor, B16, we, the tumor went what we call from cold to hot. There was nothing happening, and then suddenly with the nanoparticles and these adjuvants, boom, stuff started happening. Um, and uh, for the B16 model, uh, it slowed the tumor gro growth, but still most of the mice died. But in this other model, MC38 and some other models, half of the mice cleared their tumor. And, and uh, this, could, you know, there's a lot of theories about what's happening to T cells in the tumor microenvironment. But this really says that part of it is about tolerance, part of it about can we overcome tolerance um, and, and mimic an infection. And this goes back to William Coley, who mimicked uh, infectious disease and in, in tumor injections in the Amgen um, uh, uh, virus, oncolytic virus in melanoma that was approved. Um, but we think this is probably a real uh, clue as to why you can have T cells in a tumor. They've, they've responded based on this clonal proliferation, but they're not doing anything. And, and so they've been told, I think, that you are, this is a self reaction. You got to stop it. You got to not do this. So, um, so anyway. Uh, Given, given the brevity of the time I had, I have, we have to march along here. And this is the, actually even the very end of this, I think. Um, and it asked a basic question I asked myself when I got to it. I was so happy that we had this um, multipartite Zoom meeting to, to say, hey, you got this award. I said, oh, that's great. Um, and it is great. And then I thought, you know, no, one go, no sane person goes into science to win awards. It's just such an abstract thing. So then why, why is this a nice thing? Why am I happy to get this award? And, and I think it's because we, we work in this very strange type of business where we don't know what we're doing, that we only work on things we don't understand. So there, there's just this built-in confusion. And you can see it. It's, it's actually really palpable most of the time. Um, and, then, and then, in addition to this, uh, there's a lot of criticism. And uh, I encountered this throughout my time in science, and, and this is particularly a, 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 pungent, a pungent review from a disgruntled graduate, uh, undergraduate at Caltech, and criticizing, you know, basically, <laughs> Why are you here? Why are you the TA? You know, I could do this, but better. Probably, it probably was right. Uh, and then there's some other things that I've collected over, over the years. Uh, you know, like <laughs> some of these experiments may not work. Which is, which is why we call them experiments. You know, kind of like, you know what's, what's news about that? And then, but the absolute best is that if this paper is published, it'll set the field back tenor. I'm really, I'm very proud of that. that, that and, I, and I took this as a cry for help. That, 
if you're so insecure about your field that you think our one little paper could be that disruptive, you should worry. Uh, not just about our paper, but you should worry just in general. Things are not, things are not doing well. And then, of course, you know, has this human data been validated in a mouse? And I just, <laughs> that just, that's just, uh, that's just insane. I, I, I think uh, I respect mice as, as, you know, anyone would respect rodents, uh, vermin, but you know, it's, it's still, that's too, that's too much. So um, I think uh, we have to close here, and and I especially uh, have to thank the people that made this possible, and but the absolute most important person that made this possible was my wife, Wei Shou Chen, who's over there. Uh, and, and she has put up with me for 40 plus years for reasons that are hard to understand. Uh, but, uh, and, and there are other people in the lab as well. So, uh, and, and funding agencies that uh, didn't ask uh, that these experiments may not work, but but actually said that uh, yeah maybe this will work, <laughs> which is a slightly more positive take on on this whole uh, very uncertain business. So uh, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for this uh, amazing award and and the history of this award and how uh, important this organization has been for supporting cancer research. And, and, and being this little bright spot in this sea of negativity that we experience as, as a research people. So, thank you. I shouldn't have let Mark go first. <laughs> um, my grandsons in San Francisco, I was babysitting them, and they were asking me what country is next to Sweden, and I said, Denmark, no. Finland, no. And then they said, no way. <laughs> No way can I beat Mark's talk, and, <laughs> and no way can I beat the inspiring, touching, moving talk that Susan gave. I, I really am humbled. But I got the check, and I'm going to cash it. <laughs> so I'm obliged. I'm obliged, I'm obliged to finish. Okay. So I think in a way it makes a little bit of sense because this really started a long, long time ago in a lab far, far away. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, said by Susan that really it was very elusive and uh, it was totally serendipity. Mark knew what he was doing, I just stumbled on it. But you see, you look at these pictures and, and it's supposed to portray that the two of us actually cloned it, but obviously we didn't do anything. First of all, you see Mark doesn't have a pipette in his hand. Uh, but here, I mean, you know. I, I could imagine that, uh, you know, I could have gone away with it, but... Now, what this really did is, uh, we, today we talked, um, during the meeting, uh, it was Scott Lippmann, I really enjoyed his talk, this 9P12.3 deletion is really intriguing. And, you know, we, the, the discussion about having the keys. 
So what happens is the two of us, I mean, I think Mark wasn't even 30 years old, and I was you know, slightly over 30 years old, and we just got our driver's license, <laughs> right? And this certainly got our driver's license. Uh, but then we were handed several keys to different cars, and frankly, I didn't know what to do. Uh, first of all, <laughs> Mark cloned the mouse T-cell receptor, right? and then he turned into human and got c criticized, of course. And then I, um, you know, I moved into uh, making knockout mice. <laughs> and I only had a tool to make a knockout mice, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. So these are my two mentors, Ernest McCullough, uh, who discovered the hemopoietic stem cells, and Howard Temin, uh, who uh, cloned the reverse transcriptase. And from them, I, I, I kind of like learned that simply sailing in a new direction, you could enlarge the world. And having several keys, I started to start stumbling in different directions. And um, basically looking for something. And then um, 2003, uh, a reporter from uh, Nature Medicine came to the lab, spent one week, and then she wrote an article on me. I was really resentful. Uh, because it says, the only constant in Tag Mark's career has been changed. After leaving the Jesuit seminary, <laughs> and Ron told me that he was also in a Jesuit seminary, and then blah, 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 and he's a the scientific vagabond, and then, you know, I, I, you know during the, the, the 70s, vagabond means some bum sitting in the beach on Santa Monica Beach, not knowing what to do, right? <laughs> that he finally found his passion. And then it says drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so inspired. And I, I just left Amgen. Actually, I didn't leave Amgen, I was fired. <laughs> I was fired by uh, my friend, Roger Permuter who said that uh, he doesn't need any signs from me anymore <laughs> because the NIH uh, you know, s supports a lot of signs and he can read the literature. And I said, Roger, but I can read the literature in a different way. And he said, it's too late, you're fired. <laughs> so um, then you know, I figured I need to do drugs. And um, I met up with these two gentlemen, uh, Craig Thompson, Luke Cantley, and we started to make drugs. And uh, Hai Yen today uh, gave a brilliant talk on some of the drugs that uh, we made, and here it is. Now, one of the stories that we heard today, and I think it, it, it was uh, Dr. Barr, that uh, we needed to re-instruct or reprogram the cancer cells to be good boys and good girls. And uh, so here is the drug against IDH, well, both of which now uh, has been approved for leukemia, and uh, hopefully it will be approved uh, for uh, cholangial carcinoma. That's probably the phase three trial positive, and gliomas, it's a different story, I don't know. But you can see here, while the blast cell came down, the hematocrit went up. So this was really a reprogramming of the leukemia cells to be good boys and girls again, you know, to stop being nasty. And in fact, the main toxicity was that they recovered too fast, right? And it's called a differentiation syndrome. So you cannot, you know, wait for that to happen. Um, so, speaking of drugs again, um, my old boss, uh, Larry Susser, I, I worked at Amgen for 
for 10 years, I sold myself, my, you know, I, I was borrowed, I don't know, sold or coerced or whatever for 10 years. And uh, Larry Sousa, uh, Mark, of course, uh, Hans Wixell, Dennis Lehman, Mr. Dixit, and very, very importantly, Homer Pierce. He was, uh, he was the guy who made Jem Cytobin, a limter at Eli Lilly. And uh, he used to ride his Harley Davidson from Indianapolis into Toronto to help, to help us make drugs. And um, the, 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 the drug targets that we discovered uh, was on genomic instability. One was a PLK4, which has nothing to do with PLK1, 2, 3. In fact, there's absolutely no homology except the polar box. And you can see here now two centrioles, and in the cancer cell, you have a lot more in a you know, complex karyotype, even, even more. So with the help of, um, of Humbert Pierce, we made really good drugs. And the other actually hits right on the nail with Susan, uh, is that is TTK, uh, MPS1, which actually hits the spindle assembly. Uh, so while Texo slows it down, this speeds it up. So it's like two big trucks crashing, and, and that really uh, makes it. And the important thing is these, these targets are up very, very high in cancer cells, and so that may give us the therapeutic index. And so in our dose escalation, uh, we just all of a sudden we hit this CDK4-6 inhibitor progressor, which as you all know, is the ER positive breast cancer, which is the largest, largest group of breast cancer patients. I mean, they're not the most devastating. I mean, triple negative is most devastating. Um, we hit a couple of patients where the tumor just dramatically shrank, and we had you know, we were just saying it's not even made for ER positive. It was made against triple negative. But let's see how science can really tell us that we're wrong. But then we can find a home. And then you can see here uh, the, the, the phase two clinical trial. Looks pretty, you know, interesting. Uh, and uh, that's, that's where we are here. So... Um, now, uh, going back to the sad part, uh, we made the knock on CTLA-4 back in 1995 um, because, and, and obviously you can see here, I mean, without the gene CTLA-4, the mice died in two weeks, 10% uh, of the mouse's T cells. And so, uh, but I, you know, I had no idea. And because we're not supposed to, you know, immunologists are supposed to cure cancer, right? So I keep saying, you stupid darkness. And my good friend here, Jim Allison, who is over there actually, he won the prize a few years ago, was lighting the candle. So I am so grateful, I am so touched, and I, I just hug him every time I see him. Uh, and uh, that, of course, uh, was the idea. So, I mean, we heard today that there are like a thousand clinical trials going on. And we had no idea what to do with it. And one of the things I really noticed was uh, uh, that there were actually, here is a tumor, right? You can see the T cells trying to get in, but they really couldn't get in. There's a wall, there's a wall here. It's almost like uh, Helen of Troy, where the Greek soldiers were trying to get in, but, but they, they couldn't get in, right? And, uh, yeah. and so, this is a genius. The guy named Kevin Tracy is a neurosurgeon. I actually had dinner with him two nights before, uh, just to just make sure that uh, that that he, you know, I, I, I basically squeeze every drop of brain power from him. Um, and uh, together we discovered that curiously, T and B cells make neurotransmitters. Why are they making neurotransmitters, right? And um, so, you know, we had a, a great talk today on women, and I'm very, very proud of this particular woman, Maureen Cox, who is now a professor at the Oklahoma University. And so even though it's there, we couldn't prove that what it did. 
So she spent five years in my lab, and, and she deleted the gene acetylcholine transferase, which makes a neurotransmitter. Now, first of all, it's difficult to even believe. I mean, t this paper took um, over a year. I mean, Mark's paper takes four years, but so I feel really good. <laughs> um, but this paper took three weeks to be accepted with no revision. And she deleted that gene cytokine transferase from T cells. T cells only, because you know, all our brain needs acetylcholine. I mean, it is, it is the most important. And then uh, uh, in a virus infection, your immune cells cleared everything in 40 days. But without acetylcholine, it cannot clear. So really, for the first time, the brain actually talks to it. So I'm going to end by saying, as I get older, I realize being wrong isn't a bad thing, like they teach you in school. Right? It's been so long, I couldn't remember. It is the opportunity to learn something. So that something is CAR T. We heard about CAR T, and CAR T is really works for leukemia, lymphomas, and now for myelomas. But also, Mark also uh, said that T cell receptor are a very, very low affinity to the point he was telling me that, that, that all the biochems were said, T cell receptor in, interact with the peptide HLA at 10 to the minus four, minus five, and then you know, the conclusion is we're wasting our time. It's not important because it wouldn't be specific. It is this. And so CAR-T uh, is approved. And so we need to see TCRT because CAR-T, I think, is still going to be struggling to get to solid tumors, although it's been, you know, it's been said many times it's working. Is it work for liquid? I don't know. But this will look like it, and it does look for liquid. And so you can see here, uh, taking a cancer test this antigen, NYESO1, on an HLA-A2 background, which is Caucasians, Europeans. Now, now, I have nothing against Caucasians, Europeans. <laughs> um, but, you know, the world is so focused on it. Um, and here you can see, here are peptide, NYESO1, this is sinuphil sarcoma. This, is, this, this patient is past everything. And one single T cell receptor against this peptide, this HLA, it's called con. Okay. Now, um, my neighbor um, sadly passed away of uveal melanoma. She, she had six months, and there was nothing. I talked to all of the doctors and said, we don't even think we ever have any chance with uveal melanoma. And here is again GP100, another cancer test center, again on a Caucasian European background. Okay? Now, this is something that I was talking to with Doug Lowey, and I, you know, like there, there are two, th two people I talked to today or maybe three, um, including Mark, Susan and Doug. It's worth my walking here from Toronto because I had so much. I didn't walk, but, but it, it was so insightful. Now, this is uh, one of uh, the protégés of uh, uh, Christian Hendricks, who was at NIH. Some of you may know him. Uh, he was in, uh, in, 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 in Doug's and Steve's uh, and here it is, a single T cell receptor against the E7, which is one of the proteins of human papillomavirus. And 11 out of 12 patients responded to a single T cell receptor. And this is a cervical cancer, oral pharynx, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you know, then I go back, as all I did in my whole life, go back to my friends. And, uh, and this is a genius. His name is Naoto Hirano. And uh, my ex-student, you, you know, 
be nice to your students because one day they can meet your boss. Okay. And Pam Mohashi, a woman, she's now my boss, and Mark, and so we co-founded a new effort. And we said, let's move beyond the few TCR that is out there only against a few proteins and only for European Caucasians. Again, no, you know, nothing against you guys, but um, so because what that represents is less than 10% of the world's population. So with these two papers, 10 years of work with five postdocs day and night, um, I'm not the main author, so I you know, have to qualify that. We were able to affinity, avidity, mature 53 T cell receptors. Uh, no, 53 HLAs. So we can fish out any protein for the T cell receptor in six weeks. And um, these are the 51, class one and class two. I'm always curious what class two, I have talked to a lot of people. Inside the tumor, class two is expressed. Once you take them out, class one is only expressed. And in, in many cancers, uh, uh, about 50% of cancers, they have, they have mutated HLA class ones to avoid being killed by T cells. So I know that comes as a surprise to some of you, but I think for us it's very important. But you know, why, why do you prevent someone from sniping at you? You remove the target. And so that's really bad. And so with only that method, we can now routinely pick up T cell receptors. Uh, and uh, that, that with the normal method, uh, sorry, Mark, this was your tetramer method. You couldn't see it. Uh, but with this dimer, uh, that is just really uh, very easy. And then you can map these peptides easily by just scanning them through. So anyway, I um, went past my time, and I want to thank uh, this 25-year-old medical graduate from Japan, came to the lab in 1982. And um, it just goes to show how long it was because he just retired. Uh, uh, well, he retired from one university, went to a different university. And this is, uh, this is the reunion we had a couple of years ago. Uh, many people I need to thank. But interestingly, um, Dennis Hickstein, some of you know him. He's right here, right? I forgot his name, but he has his name tag. It says Dennis Hickstein. So Dennis. Thank you very much. He's over there. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. It's just, it's just really, really a spectacular um, honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, and congratulations once again. As you can see from all of our presenters tonight, basic science cancer research is imperative to the life-saving discoveries that directly impact cancer patients. We hope you've been inspired by all of our presentations uh, tonight, as this is also the backbone to the type of work that the National Foundation for Cancer Research supports. Wanted to share a story. So, sadly, a few weeks ago, we learned about the passing of one of our longtime donors, Erica Cornelison. She unfortunately lost her four and a half year battle with metastatic breast cancer. In one of our last conversations with her, she shared with us the following As a metastatic breast cancer patient undergoing treatment, I immediately know that patients and research are in a marathon. The record speed in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine came from the groundwork of past research. Other diseases demand similar critical attention and research. I have supported NFCR since 1999. I appreciate 
that their national position promotes a thoughtful continuum where feedback loops from across the country to inform research, coordination, and collaboration. NFCR helps break down the silos that stifle research. I understand research challenges demand sustained commitment and resources. I realize the, that philanthropy plays a critical role in advancing science. Without philanthropy, support for innovative discovery research, the big grants would not happen. Tonight, I hope you can join us and support our mission and the work of NFCR. I wouldn't be my job if I didn't have my development hat on tonight. You see on the tables around you, envelopes and donation forms. We do hope you'll consider a donation to the National Foundation for Cancer Research and support our work funding basic and translational scientific cancer research. I thank you for your support. For our online virtual audience here, there's an option uh, on the left-hand side of the, your screen uh, that you can support us as well, and certainly we would appreciate that. Um, in addition, there's many ways our donors support the work of NFCR. One of those ways, and many of you have learned who have been here at our events in the past, is through our Youth Ambassador Program. This program is an opportunity for top high school students from around the country to serve as leaders in raising awareness and support for cutting edge cancer research. The Youth Ambassadors combine a passion for sports, science, or the arts with community service to bring new energy to cancer research funding. <laughs> Typically, we would have our Youth Ambassadors here, but we decided to um, allow them to film some uh, clips to share with you tonight. So we honor three special Youth Ambassadors, April, Katie, and Sahana. We had the opportunity to speak with each of these honorees recently and want to share with you their projects and how appreciative they are, they are tonight of us providing them that recognition. My name is April and I am from Orange County, California. Uh, I went to Elisa Nagel High School and I am currently a first year at Cornell University. I lost three of my grandparents to cancer before having the opportunity to meet them in person. If I would have given the chance, I would love to feel their embrace. And so both my team and I, we pledge ourselves and to contribute to finding cures for all cancer through playing golf um, and so that more children possibly in the future can feel their grandparents and friends as well. To me to be named as the Youth Ambassador of NFCR is first and foremost a big honor and it's recognition that I've made an impact in beyond my community and that my actions showed and now I represent more than myself. Um, I represent, I also represent NFCR. Being named Youth Ambassador also allows me to access more network um, like, um, of people in the scientific field, more specifically in the cancer research field, and it gives me more opportunity to meet more people and present myself to the public as well. My name is Sahana Pariatil, and I'm an undergraduate student at UC Davis, majoring in biological sciences on a pre-med track. From a young age, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor because it is a profession that saves and improves lives. While in school, I was focused on the science curriculum, outside of school, I was pa passionate about singing, specifically Indian classical singing. In 2017, I witnessed two of my close relatives go through the unimaginable hardships and struggles of cancer. Seeing them was devastating and hearing about it was devastating as well. But what was most hard to deal with was feeling helpless in the situation. 
Unfortunately, both of them passed away, but I knew I wanted to find a way to honor them as well as help other families in a similar situation to theirs. With this in mind, I organized and sang in a two-hour Indian classical concert. I printed out tickets, flyers, and invited people from all backgrounds to come and watch the concert in order to support this cause. At the end of the event, we were able to raise $5,000 to support the National Foundation for Cancer Research. Taking on, I'm grateful to be a featured youth ambassador this year because I'm happy to be part of an organization that works hard to fight cancer and to support scientists in the lab. I'm grateful for this opportunity and I hope that I can encourage other people to use their passions to fight for causes that they are passionate about. Hello, my name is Katie Beth. I'm 15 years old and I'm from Princeton, New Jersey. In August of 2020, my grandmother was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. Shortly after, in October of 2020, she passed away. Feeling helpless just made me want to help other families avoid struggling in the same situation. Through selling baked goods that I made at home and outreach with my friends, family, and social media, I was able to raise over $15,000 for I began a GoFundMe with the help of people from NFCR and posted it on my Instagram. Through this, I was able to raise those funds. Being a youth ambassador for NFCR means so much more to me than me. Being an ambassador means honoring my grandmother and being able to help other families, whether directly or indirectly, to hopefully one day avoid similar situations. Being a youth ambassador helps me to make an impact despite my age. Congratulate all of our youth ambassadors. I know all of them tonight are out here actually watching from home with their families, so I know uh, your special recognition of them is really meaningful. So thank you once again. Um, in addition, I just want to take the time tonight to thank all of our advisors, sponsors, donors, and volunteers that have made this entire day possible. You can see a list of sponsors on the screen behind me and in your program booklets as well. Uh, for our online streaming audience, you can see the sponsors section of the platform in your virtual lobby. Special thanks to our platinum sponsors tonight, Microsoft and the CalMark Group for again, making everything that you've seen the entire day possible. We couldn't do it without the support of them and again, all, all of these sponsors, so thank you so much. Finally, for our in-person attendees, you'll notice um, on your tables there a beautiful centerpiece. Um, tonight's ceremony and prize, as you've heard, is named after Dr. Albert St. Georgie. His birthday was on September 16th. We'd like you to ask around your tables tonight and the person at your table that celebrates a birthday closest to Dr. St. Georgie's birthday on September 16th wins this nice floral centerpiece to take home. <laughs> so tonight, one person at each table will be that lucky winner, and uh, you can take that home. So... <laughs> <laughs> so while, while we're figuring that out, I just wanted to say in closing, <laughs> thank you all so much for being with us tonight, both in person here, as well as everyone online virtually. We are thrilled to be able to uh, celebrate Dr. Horowitz, Dr. Mack, and Dr. Davis's achievements tonight. Thanks again to all of our supporters, speakers, and honorees. I hope we see you all again here next year, and I hope you all have a very good night. Take care.